Live from our hurricane headquarters with real-time analysis from some of the nation's top meteorologists, this is Tracking the Tropics, powered by Bose Electric. As we press into August, we now enter, on average, the two most active months of hurricane season. The environment in the Atlantic Ocean typically becomes a bit more favorable for tropical development over the next couple of months. And there are certain things we're going to be watching for as the 2023 hurricane season continues on. Thanks, everybody, for joining us today on this edition of Tracking the Tropics. I'm your host, meteorologist Amanda Holly here at WFLA, also joined by a familiar face, WFLA meteorologist Rebecca Berry. And we are also are joined by our guest meteorologist today, Chief Meteorologist David Yeomans, a familiar face of the program from KXAN in Austin, Texas. Thanks for being here, David. Thank you guys for having me. So yeah, t today's edition is really all about the next couple of months and what we can expect. We now typically over the next few weeks see a big uptick in that tropical activity because that environment does become a bit more favorable. Luckily, we're not tracking a lot of activity right now, but we are still seeing signs that uh, the, the tropics are continuing to heat up. I'll toss it on over to Rebecca to talk about the tropical wave you're looking at on your screen, but also the other things that we're going to be watching for the over the next few months. Thanks, Amanda. And so what we're watching right now is basically much ado about nothing. We started tracking this system once when it was moving off of the coastline of Africa, and we knew that it was going to be in too heavily of a sheared environment the first couple of days as it moved through the areas uh, just past the Cabo Verde Islands. But we expected once it got a little bit further north and a little bit more over the mid-Atlantic that it would have the chance to develop. In fact, the National Hurricane Center early on placed very high chances on it to develop as, as late as two or three days ago where we're talking about a 60 and a 70 percent chance for the system to develop. Now you can see it's down to a 10% chance to develop. And so we still don't expect much of it much from this system. Even if it was to develop, all of the spaghetti models and forecast models showed it staying out over land, um, excuse me, over the ocean, never affecting land. We call those fish storms, and they're our absolute favorite kind. But now it looks like that's not even going to be a possibility. We're not even going to use a name on this system. And when we talked early on in a couple of episodes about what we expected as the El Nino started to develop, and it's still not even here yet, we're just looking at it developing, is that we would see areas of formation outside of the, the sh heavily sheared areas. The storms would be forming a little bit further north than they normally did, or as they got closer to land and out of that environment of heavy shear. And so that certainly was the thought process behind where the system might form. But despite the fact that it got away from some of those more heavily sheared environments, it still did not have the chance to develop. And so we are moving into the peak of the season. And so when we talk about hurricane season, the first couple of months are usually pretty quiet. Even when we have a preseason storm in May, or like we did this year in January. Normally, we don't really start to see things pick up until August and September. That's where we see 61% of all storms forming in those two months. And the actual peak itself is September 10th. And so we certainly expect more activity as we move through August and especially September. But the way things are shaping up right now, we've already run through a couple of names, but they were of no consequence. They didn't really affect anyone or anybody, Not some of them not even making landfall or even only becoming a named system for a couple of hours. And so we're moving into that busy August and September. The Atlantic becomes more favorable typically this time of the year. And we already know we have those skyrocketing sea surface temperatures that act like fuel for storms like this. So the whole question moving into this season was who wins out, wind shear or sea surface temperatures, because those are opposing. Wind shear keeps systems weak. It keeps them from forming. It cuts them off for their vertical development. But we all know warm sea surface temperatures act like fuel to the fire. And so the big question this season is which factor is going to end up being a bigger factor for the season. And so as the Atlantic's becoming more favorable, we typically see an increased number of the tropical waves coming off of Africa. Those are like the seeds that grow hurricanes as they move into the Atlantic. We normally see lighter wind shear and less Saharan dust. And even though Saharan dust itself is not what keeps this, this the Atlantic quiet. It's all the factors associated with the fact that we can have Saharan dust, those higher upper level winds, the drier air, and the, those sorts of factors. And so we typically see the Saharan dust winding down. I do feel like this year the Saharan dust was late to arrive and has stuck around a little bit longer and a little bit more thick than normal. 
We do have the warmest water temperatures that we've seen, unfortunately, and that's going to be a huge factor that could end up defining this year's hurricane season forecast. And so move, moving forward, let's talk about the Saharan dust. And so we had a pretty dusty sunset last night here in Tampa Bay. I don't know if you missed it or not, but we've got another decent plume moving over the Bahamas by Tuesday. And as you guys know, our viewers love Saharan dust and love talking about it and love seeing those sunsets. And so it's just one of those fun factors of the hurricane season where you can talk about uh, potential potentially some quieter things and some beneficial things for us to see those storms stave down a bit. Yeah, and if you click one more time, Rebecca, it'll zoom out and you can see we're still kind of seeing some of those plumes coming off the coast of Africa, which is good news for now. But eventually uh, those will kind of shut off and we will likely see more of those tropical waves coming off the coast of Africa. Before I send it to David for just a second, I, I do want to remind you we are taking your questions, your featured comments and questions. If you use the hashtags all around your screen, hashtag Hey Amanda, Hey Rebecca and Hey David, we can answer your questions here on Tracking the Tropics in real time about this year's hurricane season, what we can expect, and uh, anything you have about the, any questions that you have about the tropics. But I do want to ask you, David, you know, what are your thoughts on the hurricane season so far? And what are you going to be looking forward to, you know, going over the next couple of months? Well, Rebecca said it really well. And just to build off that, you know, this is a season of uncertainty and it's one unlike we've ever seen before. It's going to be really interesting to see how the next few months play out. The combination of an El Nino making the storm environment a little more hostile but also with these record warm sea surface temperatures. Luckily, we've had the benefit so far of Saharan dust helping to keep things quiet generally, but all you need are a couple breaks in that to get this little uh, marsupial pouch, some researchers call it, of high mid-level moisture, a little seedling to form a hurricane, even with dust all around it. We've seen that certainly before. Uh, but as you mentioned, August, September, this is when things really start to ramp up. It feels like every, uh, every single hurricane season about this time, we're saying, don't worry, there's still more coming. There's still more coming. I know hurricane season started a couple months ago, but this is when the bulk of the storms come. Uh, last year, as you guys know, August was very quiet, but then September brought Florida the devastating Hurricane Ian. Back here in Texas, we've been spared a major hurricane impact since 2017 when we had Hurricane Harvey. That was a late August, early September storm. So the main event still to come. And uh, again, just a reminder there, we are taking your questions. We had a couple of featured comments coming in. This first question from Richard Ayala on WFLA's Facebook page it says, hashtag, hey, Amanda, what will happen to the trees and houses in Tampa Bay when the storm and hurricanes come? And David, you kind of just talked about this. You know, we had a devastating hurricane impact parts of Florida last year with Hurricane Ian, and we did see a lot of destruction uh, with that hurricane. Now, specifically with Tampa Bay, we haven't been hit by a major hurricane in over 100 years. So that is a big question that a lot of us meteorologists worry about what will happen to the trees and houses because it, they really haven't been tested in 100 years. So, uh, you know, that's what we say, prepare now and, you know, you can prepare your house and, and uh, your infrastructure as best as possible. You can trim the trees around your house to help get those ready if, if a big storm does come. But if there are weakened structures, you know, they could be more susceptible to a, a big storm there. But I do agree with you, David. Uh, you know, there, there's going to be a lot of question marks over the next couple of months on what plays out, including, uh, you know, the El Nino and the sea surface temperatures. It's been a big topic here on tracking the tropics all season long. And this featured comment coming in from Timothy on the W. FLA Facebook page saying, but I thought with El Nino, we didn't have too many storms because they couldn't form. And we've talked about that a little bit so far. Yes, it's the competing factors. El Nino typically uh, prevents the storm from forming because it provides a little bit stronger winds in the Atlantic, but counteracting El Nino, we do have those record warm water temperatures, Rebecca. Yes, and so I do think this is going to be an interesting season because of the expected increase in shear. I think that when we talk about where we normally see storms forming in August, a lot of it is right there in the middle of the Atlantic where we expect this year to be the highest. And so I think that looking back on this season, my prediction is that we're going to see storms forming outside of our normal formation zones, a little bit further north, a little bit further south, and also closer to land. Because once the systems get closer, once they pass those lesser Antilles and get closer to Hispaniola and Cuba, they will be expect out of that expected area of shear. And so I could see a lot of potentially fast forming storms in the Gulf or closer to the coastline in the Atlantic. The only good news with that 
is that we that it doesn't have time to build up too much strength. Of course, we have outliers like the rapid intensification, in, intensification with Charlie, um, and also also we, with uh, Andrew. But we also would not expect the systems to have as much time to reach those major category storms if they were to form closer to land. Now, we were talking about that before the stream started. David, you mentioned that, you know, a little bit closer to home, those storms, if they do form. Uh, one thing that, you know, I think about when we do have those storms that closer to uh, form closer to home is that we have a little less time to prepare for those right. storms just because they, they, you know, they're not traveling for two weeks across the Atlantic before they get here. And we don't have those cones that change every so often. If they form close to home, you know, you have to be prepared right away. That's exactly right, Amanda. And that was a problem that the mayor of New Orleans ran into some heat for after Hurricane Ida two years ago. Now you have a major hurricane all of a sudden and you don't have the 48 or 72 hours of lead time to evacuate a major city. I think you guys are nailing it. I think close in development is going to be a real issue for us later uh, this season. Now, of course, we need a little seedling, a little beginning of a storm to cause problems. But I was looking at the extended ensemble models it looks like while wind shear kind of remains in the main development region and the Caribbean Sea on and off, the Gulf remains very low shear for the next two to three weeks, potentially. Uh, we're also seeing some signs on the models of kind of some broad pressure falls in the Eastern Caribbean and out into the main development region next week and the following week. That could be more conducive to more African easterly waves or more storm seedlings, if you will, uh, coming off the coast. The Gulf, as you <laughs> very well known in Florida is record hot. It's two to four degrees hotter than normal across the basin, 88, 90 degree water temperature. So with the Gulf remaining sort of farther north than that El Nino shear zone, I think something could happen very quickly in the Gulf, really at any time this season. And as you guys mentioned, that's kind of a nightmare scenario for Tampa, for Houston, for anywhere along the Gulf Coast. Yeah, and it's been a weird weather pattern this summer anyway with, uh, you know, un un unusually late fronts just kind of hanging out. And we don't like fronts because, you know, we can see storms form off of those decaying fronts in the Gulf. And uh, that would also be a, a situation where we could see a storm form close to home. But, yes, I can attest to the water temperatures. I was in the Keys last <laughs> week. And those, you know, the Keys water temperatures have been in the news for, uh, you know, several weeks now and can attest in the in the canals, the water temperatures were at 96 degrees. So ah. water temperatures, very warm, uh, and that could be uh, not good news if something were to form close to home. Sure. And it's also going to be dependent on the ridges. You know, we've I know you guys just had your hottest July in history over in Tampa. We just had the same with a separate heat dome that's sitting over Austin and central Texas. It looks like in a week or two, the position of those ridges may split just a little bit. Our ridge heads west. The Bermuda High is a little bit east of you guys. And that could, if we do have a, a storm tracking from the Caribbean or something in the Gulf, it could open up a little window of favorability, not only for development, but possibly for something moving northwestward or northward through the Gulf. Again, we don't have anything that we're watching in that area yet, but if something does develop, the positioning of those ridges could be crucial into where it goes, of course. Overall, it's been, it's been a, a little bit of a strange season in general, you know, with the competing factors, we had a kind of a, an early start uh, to hurricane season with so many storms forming right away, then it kind of died off, then we've been watching a couple, a couple of waves here. Uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens over the next couple of months with uh, these competing factors as we enter, you know, the typically the busiest part of hurricane season. Got one more comment coming in here from Susan on KFDX's Facebook page and just said, you know, just basically a comment that said, this is so interesting. Thank you for this information. And you are welcome, Susan. That's kind of what we do here on Tracking the Tropics. We just have a discussion about what's going on out there. Luckily, we're not tracking an active storm, but when we do, we also have uh, consistent updates with the those storms and where they could be headed. But right now, and over the past several weeks, we've just been talking about what could happen. And just, just to keep everyone kind of at home uh, prepared for, for what could happen here over the next, the next few months. And so right now we're just kind of taking a look at the, the, um, the activity graph of how, you know, we do see a big increase in that tropical activity on a normal season, Rebecca. Yeah. And so I am hoping that this continues to be an abnormal season and it just stays quiet. But <laughs> but uh, history tells us that the next two months will, will probably be a little more active. Um, hoping for that wind shear to kick in big time. I really appreciate that. I'm, and I am worried about the sea surface temperatures. So uh, it's, those competing factors are really going to be the big question mark of the season. 
Anything we to- certainly hope you guys get a break over in Florida as well after last year. Your neighbors over here in Texas, we've been thinking of you guys recovering from Hurricane Ian. And I know you guys had a couple other storms that you dealt with last year. So hopefully nothing heads your way. Yeah, hopefully, hoping for a quiet season. Hoping things cool down for you guys there in Texas as well. <laughs> Send us some rain. I know you guys have some pop-up storms sometimes. We Just send a few, just like a day or two. That's <laughs> yeah, all we need. Yeah, just to cool <laughs> off for one day. Give all, yeah, all your infrastructure a break from the heat, let Please. alone the tropical systems. You guys have been tested in a lot of different areas over the past few years. David, is sure. there anything you've been talking about uh, to your viewers about hurricane season in general? I know it's you know been a year or so, but um, you know, is there anything you're you know continuously keeping an eye on? Well, you know, it's going to be, it's interesting how hurricanes kind of um, come and go from people's minds. In Tampa, it's kind of front of mind every hurricane season, I realize, because it has to be. But in central Texas, we're 150 miles from the coast. We don't often get direct impacts from storms, but that last hurricane to make landfall in Texas, Hurricane Harvey, you know, for a year, two years, three years after that, everybody was watching the tropics, even inland in Austin. Uh, Now, I feel like that kind of storm fever in Texas has faded a little bit. But of course, that can be a dangerous thing because the longer you go without one of these storms, the more due you are for one of these storms statistically. So we're going to make sure that our viewers and our folks who travel to the coast and have property along the coast are mindful during hurricane season. And as I mentioned, I think that close in development with lower wind shear and really hot temperatures in the Gulf could be a big factor for us. It could be, you know, there's no storm on Tuesday and then on Thursday, you've got a full fledged hurricane heading for the coast. It's why everybody should really pay close attention this year. Yeah, and we've got, you know, a couple of new tools to help us out this year with uh, hurricane season and tracking tropical systems. But again, if they form close to home, uh, we have to be ready to go at a moment's notice. And to your point, David, you know, it's it's been a long time since our area, just the Tampa Bay area, has seen a direct impact from a major storm. So, yeah, the storm fatigue, well, yeah, we, we need to be on our toes as well just because it's been a long time doesn't mean that it won't ever happen again. I know a lot of people right. like to talk about that here in the Tampa Bay area, but it is possible for sure. Um, any any last thoughts, Rebecca, for today's episode and the months ahead? Well, I just worry because I also think that people think that, like, I think Tampa Bay feels like they got impacted by Ian last year, whereas right. it was really Fort Myers. And so I think most of us have been through some potentially tropical storm force rain bands, but most of us have not lived through a hurricane. And I think that's where the vast difference in level of preparation comes is that we think, oh, well, that wasn't that bad. I didn't even lose power. Well, it didn't hit you. It hit someone, you know, hundreds of miles away. And you just saw the the preparation in ahead of time because you were in the cone at a certain point. And then you you just basically lived through kind of a kind of a rainy day. And that's it. So I, I do right. worry about that. Yes. Yeah. I think I, you hit the nail on the head, you know, in, in all the hurricanes you've covered and I've covered. I always talk to people and say, uh, you, you're in a mandatory evacuation. You've got to get out. And they say, this isn't as strong as hurricane so-and-so. I lived through that and my house was fine. Well, hurricane so-and-so hit 110 miles away. So you actually didn't live through that. So you're right. Every storm is different. Every track is different. And that's why it's important this year. Every quadrant is different too with the, right. with that track as well. You know, we were on the north side of Ian here in the Tampa Bay area. And, uh, you know, we had... we. We certainly got impacts, but again, the farther south, it was it was much worse, and it was different impacts over on the east coast of Florida as well. So every storm is different. you got to pe- prepare uh, for every single storm that could come our way. And we'll take this one last featured question from Richard on the WFLA Facebook page saying, hashtag, hey, Rebecca, how long does hurricane season last? <laughs> well, it feels like it lasts forever. <laughs> 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 but the official answer is until the end of November. <laughs> yeah, so we have, uh, we have the busiest month ahead and we're going to continue to be here every single Wednesday on tracking the tropics giving you updates on what we're tracking and just a topic of the week if we're not tracking anything and hopefully it continues to stay quiet but uh, as we look at the average hurricane seasons over the past numerous years since we've been keeping records we knew we do know that we typically see an up uh, uptick in the activity here especially over the next couple of months and October specifically uh, we have to stay on our toes here in the state of Florida because we can be impacted a little bit more. So I think that's going to do it for this edition of Tracking the Tropics. Remember, we are live every single Wednesday on this app or Facebook page or this platform that you are watching from right now. It's interactive. We love to take your questions and uh, kind of get nerdy with the tropics a little bit here. But you can rewatch this episode and every past episode on trackingthetropics.tv as well. So thanks for joining us for 
for this week's episode. We'll be live again next Wednesday at 1230 uh, or if something forms before then and it warrants it. Thanks so much for watching, everybody. For Rebecca, David, and myself, we'll see you next week. Find Tracking the Tropics on these platforms. And for storm updates, the latest models, and helpful resources, visit trackingthetropics.tv.